Welcome back to all of you joining from LinkedIn, YouTube, and La Vanguardia. Uh, just apologies, we had some technical problems and we are going to restart the session. Remember that this session, though, will be available from uh, to view on demand on our LinkedIn page as soon as the session is over. So your comments, again, welcome. So you can write them down uh, on the live stream. So let's start talking about climate risk and real estate and the global trends that will shape the post-pandemic market. There are four global changes that they are reshaping the world. Health-related changes, technology-related changes, climate changes, and globalization changes. We are going to focus a lot about climate today because of the session is about climate risk, but we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the four of them because uh, we're going to see that they are all interconnected and we need to understand them as a, as a whole let's start with health there are uh, many 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 new research on health research that has been going for a long time improvements new medical products that they are increasing the human lifespan so think about that somebody who is 23 today has a life expectancy of 100 years this has a lot of general implications for uh, for humanity and for businesses. The uh, first one you can think is the traditional model of education, work, and retirement. This is dead. We cannot think about having some education, then a period of several years, decades where we work, and then we retire. Because retirement, if we're going to live over 100 years, that's going to be a long period. So we have to change that. We have to reinvent ourselves many times through our, our lives. And this has implications for real estate and has big implications for cities. So we see we need to rethink cities, how and where people work and live. This is going to change. We have time horizons now that they are way longer. And therefore, education and talent are going to become more important. So cities are going to be fighting for talent to attract and retain talent. And a lot of business opportunities and real estate opportunities specifically are going to arise from that. We're going to talk about opportunities towards the end of the, of the talk today. Let's talk now about technology. There have been also technological changes in the past decades. So now we are in an era of digitalization, automation, and you might think about the fourth industrial revolution. We have more connected devices than ever, like almost seven connected devices per person uh, nowadays and uh, increasing. And this has, again, implications for businesses, for real estate and for cities, for metropolitan areas. Think about 5G. 5G means automated cars, internet of things. So how are cities going to change with that? We have the suburbs and the center of the cities. How the suburbs versus the center is gonna change when we have automated cars for example, that they can guarantee you uh, an arrival time in the center, so no uncertainty about traffic. How the relative prices between suburbs and center are gonna change with that. How uh, the relative suburb versus center is gonna change when we have e-commerce delivery with drones and when we have e-commerce extended everywhere. In some sense, right, the COVID-19 uh, crisis that we are living right now is accelerating some of these uh, technological changes, also the health uh, research that we just talked about uh, a minute ago. We have uh, now more technological changes that they allow us to work from home, for example. And we say the, the model of working nine to five uh, is dead. We think about that. Now we are connected 24 hours. We can work from home. We can attend sessions online from home and we'll have more flexibility. This COVID-19, again, uh, it's been triggering changes that they might have happened in, uh, in the period of a few years. Now uh, we are seeing it right now. And again, there are gonna be opportunities when you think in terms of businesses, but also in, in terms of real estate that they are gonna arise because of these technological changes. Let's talk about climate as well. Let's say the main body of the, of the talk today is going to be about, about climate risk. Let's talk about that. So let me show you uh, a map of the San Francisco Bay Area. When we talk about 
climate change, we talk about weather and catastrophic events that they are on the rise around the world. Let's see uh, what might happen to the San Francisco Bay Area if there is a global rise in temperature of two to three degrees on average. So this is what might happen to the San Francisco Bay Area. And this is a simulation of the sea level raise. So we will have areas that they're gonna be underwater in the next decade. That's gonna be something between 50 and 100 years from now. So airport of San Francisco underwater, airport of Oakland underwater, and most of the properties on the coastline that are gonna be underwater as well due to this raise in the, in the sea level. But we're not gonna talk about that today. We're gonna to talk about fire more than water. Uh, and one of the reasons is because we are seeing already uh, fire events driven by, uh, by heat, by high temperatures, by, by low humidity. And this is an image of uh, uh, Australia. Remember, like just a few months ago in December, we're talking about, we had in the news every day, the fires in Australia. This is, seems that it's almost forgotten now because of COVID-19. But like, this is a huge uh, event and these are fire are huge events that they are affecting a lot of uh, businesses. So let me show you large destructive events and how these have a big impact in the number of mortgages and house prices. So fire events in California, these are the top five fire events in this table that we are, we are seeing right now. Uh, let's focus on the first one. The first one is a fire called Cedar. It affected 1,542 properties with mortgages. So these are the properties that they were inside the fire that they get burned down. There were over 7,000 properties in the ring one mile around the fire and almost 7,000 7, properties, 6,784, between one and two miles from the fire perimeter. So indirectly affected, right? This is a lot, but this is not only one fire, right? We have a fire cedar in 2003, which in 2007, fire were 2008. So in the recent years, we had many fires with, uh, that affected uh, many, many houses and many, many houses with mortgages. Therefore, the impact, not just to the real estate markets, but also to the finance markets, like through the mortgage, the lenders, the banks is important. Let's focus on a case study. This is a fire that happened in Oakland in 1991. I picked this example because then we can see the long run effects of a, of a climate uh, driven event like that. So this is a densely populated area like near the Berkeley and Oakland in California. Uh, because of this fire, 25 people died, 150 people got seriously injured. They were burned 1,540 acres more than 3,000 single family homes were totally destroyed. 437 apartment buildings, uh, apartment units right, in buildings were destroyed and over 2,000 vehicles were destroyed. So the overall replacement cost was uh, over 3 billion of 1991 dollars. So we can look now because we have perspective, we can look at what happened in the real estate markets in this specific area uh, over the years. So this is what happened we have 8.9% uh, average price increase in the, the tunnel fire area. Tunnel fire is the red area in the map, right? This is the area that was burned, that was on fire. These little dots are houses and you can see the streets and the houses. These are houses with mortgages that they were burned because of the Oakland tunnel fire area. And the prices of the houses that they were rebuilt in these areas, they've been going up at an average of 8.9% from 1992 till 2016. So this is a big effect of you know, fire, reconstruction, rebuilding, and improving of the areas. But importantly, not only matters the area of the fire, but also the areas that they were close to the fire. So there are externalities here because the area in orange, this is the area that's in, in between the border and 0 0.25 miles of the perimeter ring, prices went up almost 8%, 7.9. And in 0 0.5 miles, 6.3%. So their house prices have been going up in areas where there's been 
a fire, specifically on this one. Five takeaways from the 1991 Oakland Tunnel Fire. First takeaway, affected homes were required to cover additional costs of build to code requirements. This is because of insurance. So there, are the, there is the casualty insurance, okay, that's covering. So insurance companies affected, but also homeowners have to pay for cleaning up the lots uh, and other additional costs. Second takeaway, coordination externalities. So what happens here, the bigger the fire, the larger the fire, the more uh, effects you have uh, in terms of uh, getting houses, better houses, modernized structure, and uh, following the build to core requirements. Third takeaway, the new reconstruction, reconstructed houses in the fire area were more valuable. So fires are taking, uh, they take advantage basically of rebuilding and creating like larger houses, better houses where uh, there were older houses before. Four point mortgage borrowers eh, in the areas devastated had relatively low mortgage default rate. So it's not that there is a fire, I default on the mortgage. In most cases it's like there is a fire and I wait because I kind of bet on the rebuilding of the neighborhood and the improvement of my, of my neighborhood. And point five, finally, there are disincentives of mortgage default that they last over a long time. So there are effects on the fire, they last for years and years, at least uh, in the mortgage markets. This is not an isolated case, the tunnel fire in 1991. So if you see this map, this is a map from all, with all the fires marked here from year 2000 to 2018. So in 18 years, this is all the area of California that got burned. So whatever didn't get burned is the Central Valley and some part of the coast. And this is the desert, right? So a lot of big, large part of California has been burned in the last uh, 20 years. Let me show you here what's happening with temperatures and uh, rain. So we have precipitation in the y-axis and temperature in the, in the, in the x-axis. What we see is the weather and is going from a cold and wet towards more hot and dry weather. And the largest fires are going to start appearing now in the 2000s. So we've seen the large, the last few years in the 2000s, we have very high temperatures, very low precipitation and more fires. So I'm not here being an advocate of climate change or anything like that. I'm just pointing out like there is a relationship here, at least a correlation between weather and events. So when we have so much digital data and we put again together technology, uh, data, and, um, and, and climate change, we can estimate the probability of fires at a very, very detailed level. So this is the Los Angeles area, right? This is LA, right? This is Malibu, this is San Diego down here. And this is our, these are our estimates in a project that I've been working with uh, several uh, researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, where we studied the fires in California, and we can we are able to estimate the probabilities of fire at the property level and the costs uh, and the implications for mortgages, so for banks and lender and for insurance companies. So these is are these are our estimates for January 2017. The probabilities in April, you see this is getting more orange and red towards the summer. This is July, right? The probabilities are very high, and they are very high in areas also close to uh, vegetation, like forests where the trees are. And then towards uh, the fall in uh, October, it goes down a little bit. And if we go down to uh, January again, right, you see the probabilities are way lower. So we can estimate that. And this is important because um, mortgage lenders, so think about banks, they have to estimate the, the probabilities of default and they are gonna change with the probabilities of uh, these fire events. So this is changing. Um, we see because of climate changes, the implications for cities and metropolitan areas are gonna be um, several. Right? Think about places that they used to be very desirable and they're not gonna be desirable anymore. Like who wants to live in a place where this place can get burned, even if it's a nice views right, in, a, in the woods, with views to the to the lake or to the ocean who wants to live in a place where 
the probability of getting burned is very high or flooded very often. So who wants to live in a place that is uh, extremely hot with lack of water, with lack of uh, resources? So new real estate developments and new urban plants will have to adapt to the effects of climate change. Again, there are going to be a lot of opportunities here. And these opportunities are going to rise very soon. Don't think about that this is going to happen in the next decades. This year, this past year, actually, in December uh, 2019, the European Central Bank, the European Banking Association, they sent out some notes saying that they're going to uh, regulate climate risk soon. So if you put climate risk into the models of, uh, of the banks, like this is going to have an effect directly to mortgages, directly to uh, real estate lending, and therefore to real estate prices. And we started seeing this in the United States, where the mortgage uh, lending has been starting adapting this. And we started seeing this especially uh, in the mortgage, in, uh, in the house insurance. Fire insurance in California is getting very expensive. Flood insurance in the US is getting very expensive. And this is going to have an effect in real estate prices uh, very, very soon. So let's talk about globalization now. And then we go to opportunities. All right, globalization. Uh, we talk about globalization, we think about the increase in the flow of people, ideas, and culture. And nowadays with COVID-19, we don't even need to uh, justify that there is a degree of globalization that's pretty high in the world. So this is a map of the um, people, the, conf the new cases, the confirmed cases, and the deaths of COVID from COVID-19. And more than the relative numbers, that it's not relevant for this session, although it's very sad, obviously, is that we have cases here from the French Polynesia to Greenland to uh, New Zealand. So there have been cases all around the world. And this is a problem that didn't exist a few months ago, right? So globalization is affecting our businesses and it's affecting also real estate. The implications for cities of the globalization, there are several. So think about salaries. Now we are going to a world from a world where every city, every country uh, had similar characteristics to a world where we have local salaries and global salaries within the same metro metropolitan area. This creates local inequality, although there is less global inequality, right? The conversions of at the country level or at the uh, Asia's converging with, uh, with uh, Western economies. Even there is less global inequality, there is more local inequality. And we need sustainable social and healthcare systems. We are learning this now uh, the hard way. And uh, we need to have income and wealth redistribution. This means better pension systems. This means a way to make them sustainable. And globalization is pushing for that. We also have issues with the supply chain that we were not that aware of in, till recently, right? We, have, uh, we are going to have less imports from China, probably. And we need cities that they are better uh, uh, prepared for issues with uh, the supply chain. So we're going to see how we readjust the imports from China versus the, the local production. There are going to be opportunities here as well. So let's talk about the opportunities. And let's start concluding with, uh, with the session talking about opportunities because this is, there are going to be, there have been things and they are going to affecting or they're affecting us in a very sh short run, but we need to think a little bit on the opportunities in the, in the long run. We need to understand that these different global changes as a whole create opportunities. Let's think about a changing world right? and when we have these opportunities. Let's think about working from home. What are the effects on offices and residential real estate? So this is Zoom, right? Most of you have used Zoom video communications, right? which is uh, this platform that allows us to connect and have virtual meetings. If you had bought shares of Zoom in December, you would have paid $62. Nowadays, on the last price, it's $150. Right. So I think from December till now, right, the expectations 
of this increase in working from home eh, have more than doubled. So the prices have like gone from 62 to 150 in just you know three four months. And so this seems that uh, there are opportunities in technologies when you think in terms of working from home. And this has a special effects on the office markets, but potential real estate markets. We have to think people in the real estate industry, what type of buildings will we need from now on? And whoever adapts better to these new realities and this new situation uh, will succeed. There are other opportunities relating to the working from home. If you think about the technology itself with the infrastructure, these are the shares of American Tower Corporation. Okay, American Tower Corporation owns uh, plots of land with, uh, with towers, so communication towers, and they rent the towers to the to the to the operators, and these shares were at 209 in the same date in December 12. Now are at 254. So most of the real estate investment trusts, most of the REITs, most of the real estate investments have gone down uh, or have stopped during the crisis. Not everything, right? Infrastructure related to technology is still going going up. Let's think about changes that there are are happening also nowadays and let's brainstorm a little bit about the, the opportunities that we have out there think about um about shopping and and e-commerce okay and we are hearing here questions like uh the people are, are are asking in the chat people saying what happens and what is the worst scenario for example javier is saying what's the worst scenario that we can expect after the the, the lockdown and then this is like uh, something that is going to be uh, very, very related to uh, retail, for example. We can focus the 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 effects are going to be uh, going to affect uh, too many sub industries, but we can think about retail. What's happening with shopping and uh, e-commerce? Okay, so with shopping and e-commerce, um, we have um, effects. That if you look, for example, at Simon Property Group, this is a this is a, a REIT, a real estate company that owns uh, basically malls and shopping malls, so retail. So what happened with their stock price, so therefore with their expectations from December to now, right? Went from 149, okay, it went down to 54, so okay, almost almost one third. So markets are expecting right a reduction on physical shopping versus versus e-commerce and this is happening already uh, in the in the market so we have to think how we adapt to this eh? and these opportunities think like another real estate investor more related to e-commerce like prologis like prologis they own the the buildings for example where where, where amazon and other e-commerce platforms operate right this is about logistics so uh, in the same period eh, from december 12 Till now, right? The price has been went up and down, but this is the same price that we had before. It's not half of one third. So the market is perceiving uh, this in a uh, this shopping versus e-commerce in a different way. We're going to see changes. We're going to see changes. We are seeing changes already, and uh, what we are seeing is that again, this global versus local is gonna is 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 changing and is gonna change. So think about e-commerce platforms for the local stores how this is how these uh, there are opportunities in these in these sub markets as well uh, we can talk about tourism we can talk about tourism as well and for example the effect in hotels so so far right there has been a decline in the effect of of, of hotel and then this uh, we are seeing a decline uh, in in hotel and tourism activity. Think about also about new buildings eh, and developments. Um, how this is changing? Well, you know, uh, we've seen, for example, in in China that you could build a hospital for a thousand people eh, with a thousand beds in six days. Right? How this change, this new concept, this new era might uh, change the real estate development. We have competitors everywhere. We need buildings that they have to adapt to the different type of, uh, of situations we have in the world. So we have different opportunities. Somebody is asking here, Wei Chu is asking, how will the residential real estate price be impacted by COVID-19? So in the very short run, 
right? In the very long run, if the economy is doing well, right? At the end of the day, everything reverts to, to a growth. In the short run, what we expect is like a few months of uh, in where the market is going to be a little bit on stop, uh, in a stop in a standby uh, and in a stop and go. This means that there is going to be uncertainty. There is already uncertainty in, 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 in real estate prices. And the buyers are looking for a discount. Sellers, they don't want to make a discount. So we are in this kind of a standby situation. This is going to depend the effect. Is it going to be a drop or not, or a larger or a, or a, or a, or a, or a more a small drop in prices? It's going to depend at the end of how long this COVID-19 effect lasts. If we have a vaccine, if we have anti antivirals in September or in October, right? This uh, this effect is going to be way shorter than than uh, than, than than we expect. If not. Right, the, the the we can see declines in in real estate prices in the next in the next few months. We have also questions on the, if do you foresee lower mortgage rates after the pandemic? Like Solomon Williams is asking. Well, uh, these here we have a supply and a, and a demand uh, effect. Right uh, after the pandemic. If there is uncertainty, right, in a more uncertain world, we should have mortgage rates that they, they should be higher. On the other hand, we have the, the, the regulators right, uh, basically uh, uh, acting, right, and acting like injecting capital into the, into the financial systems to, to control uh, the interest rates. Otherwise, right, inflation might go up or uh, there might be more defaults, right? So, uh, we don't expect huge increases in mortgage rates, but uh, this world of low mortgage rates forever is probably uh, going to end sometime uh, soon. Let's, uh, we have one minute, right? So let's, uh, let's see the final questions. Here we have Jordi saying, what are your thoughts on the future of the US uh, rental market? So here we, what we are seeing, we are seeing this already. Uh, uh, change totally in the different submarkets, right? We, we have an effect in uh, residential. Okay, residential, it's uh, becoming more stable. It's becoming like a safe type of real estate asset in, in bad times. We see people still need a place to live. And especially if you are confined, you need a place to live, a better place to live. You have, uh, in offices, this is going to change. We have tenants renegotiating contracts uh, with the landlords in offices. If there is more work from home, probably we need less offices and better offices, more equipped. So uh, this is going to change. Uh, hotels, uh, very different. Again, the, the type of uh, rental agreements that we're going to have in, in, in hotels. And in logistics also is a, a totally different market where e-commerce is, is going up. But again, uh, this is going to be very, and the changes are going to be at a very, very micro, very micro uh, level. So uh, let's conclude with uh, this session. Let me just say you uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for being uh, connected here. Remember that this session will be available for viewing on demand on LinkedIn as soon as the, as the, as the live streaming is over. Remember also to be sure that tomorrow you join us. Hopefully we won't have technical problems tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, April 21st, at our usual time, 4 p.m. Central European time, uh, we'll have a session with uh, Nino Vaccaro and Mike Rosenberg. Uh, and also, I encourage you to visit the, the ESS uh, website, uh, www.iesc.edu, to see our, our, our sessions and uh, all the list of sessions. So thank you very much, all of you. Take care, and I hope to see you soon uh, live again. Thank you.